This year we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians under the title A.D., the year of the Lord. Our world is obsessed with chasing our dreams and following our ideas and feelings. But instead of being fulfilled, we're struggling and wasting our time. We need a Lord, someone we respect who can tell us what's true and how to live. May these messages inspire you to trust the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. under instruction. It's really good to see you all here this morning. Um, Can I start with a question? I just did, didn't I? (laughs) That's not my question. My question is, why do we so often get tempted to forget who our true father really is? I'll come back to that. A couple of weeks ago at work, we had a communication workshop and we had a, a psychologist do this little exercise with us and she got us in pairs and said, one person tell a story to the other one. can be anything, any story. So we did that. We started, started talking, started telling a story, one person listening, one person uh, telling. And uh, then at two minutes in, she yelled out, blank face. And the person listening just suddenly disengaged, totally nothing. No response, no interaction. Do you know how hard it is to keep telling a story when somebody's doing that? It was like all the, all the stories just whew, died, absolute death. And it reminded me of um, this story I heard when I was at uni, that there was a, a psychology class that a professor was teaching, and uh, he was teaching for the semester, and the, all the students in this class got together and they talked amongst themselves and said, okay, when the, when the lecturer, when he starts, if he moves over to this side of the stage or the classroom everybody just um, sit up take notes look interested just start you know appreciating what he's doing if he starts moving this way uh, just lean back put your pens down maybe yawn look pretty you know just just dis- disengage and the story goes that in this lecture hall over here there was like this radiator on the wall sort of sitting there not it wasn't on at the time but it just plugged there by the end of the semester the professor was pretty much sitting on the, on the radiator, just, just chatting. And they so convinced him to do that by non-verbal communication. And psychologists tell us that our communication is actually only about 20% and, uh, from spoken word and 80% uh, non-verbal. So to that end, could you all stand with me, please? And we're just going to do a little bit of non-verbal communication as we pray with God. Um, grab your hands, have a look at your hands, put them out in front, turn them over, look at your wrists, you'll see tendons and veins and stuff. Look at your palms. If you're really cool, just put them out a bit wider. This is the, um, this is the I'm ready to receive Christian pose. Um, but it's actually, it's also, if we were playing footy, this is like, I'm ready to, re- you know, throw me the ball, basketball, whatever, I'm ready to receive. So let's, let's pray. Father, we just stand here in your presence at this time. Uh, we've just got a few moments, Lord, to... Uh, really be with you and to connect with you and um, just really conscious Lord that this time is um, far beyond the words I say it's about your Holy Spirit talking to each and every one of us and I know that that's what you want to do that one word from you uh, sustains us so much more than all the other words that we hear and so Lord that's what I'm praying for Um, even now as we just stand and take a moment Be speaking to us, Lord. You know what every person here needs to hear. We're just open. We're open to hear. We just spend a moment. Thank you for your presence. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to talk to you about this question of why are we so often tempted to forget who our true father really is? Why do we forget? that we are his children. Now, most of us are pretty lucky to have been raised in the lucky country. Um, I know not everybody has, but Australia's a pretty lucky country to be brought up in. I certainly am very grateful for the upbringing that I had. Um, And, you know, great family, great parents, mum and dad, love God, love people, which is Christianity, really. Um, but I'm also really aware that not everybody had that experience and that there's so much things that happen in life and circumstances and things outside of our control that, that form who we are, that give us in our identity that we end up t- thinking about um, or being, being who we are. And I, you know, things have changed so much. Um, what was the lucky country is certainly not 
been perfect for everybody and there's been so much change even in the time that I uh, have grown up. I had one friend, uh, a neighbour whose parents separated and that was really unusual. Now any classroom you go into, so many kids are having to deal with sharing and, and parents pass away and the, it seems like there's sickness there. We, the society moves around so much more. Uh, we, we maybe even uh, lose lose parents just that have got older and we end up with um, I guess a sense of who we are from all of that upbringing and 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 what we what we tell ourselves about that now again psychologists tell us that we are the the sum of all those experiences that we have plus our self-talk what we say about ourselves. So it can be quite different for different people. Some pe people could go through one experience and they say that my, my upbringing was really um, uneventful. And for one person, they might see that as being uh, peaceful. And another person might describe that as being boring. Or somebody might have been in a defense family and moved around and look back on their teenage years and go, you know what? I, it was, we were transient, moved, I could never make good friends, um, it was horrible. And another person might do the same thing and go, I was such an adventure and I lived in towns all over Australia and made friends everywhere. So our self-talk ends up making us who we are. I'm going to get back to that. Things have changed. Things... Um, don't always work out perfectly, do they, with our upbringing, our relationships. The thing that can really happen, and I've seen happen, is that our confidence takes a hit. How confident are you? And I'm talking about confidence in your identity and knowing who you are and knowing who God says you are. Sometimes when you've been confident and then you've lost that confidence, then it really stands out. Some people maybe never found that confidence. But can you imagine just what we would do and be like if we had absolute confidence in knowing that God is our Father and we are His children? And I kind of, kind of looking at it like... You could agree with me or disagree with me, okay? but if you look around at how we live, you go, I can see where we lack confidence, like just what we do and what we don't do, the way we interact and how we don't interact. You see some people that really do have confidence, and then you know when you wish you could do that, but you withdraw because you don't have that confidence. Hmm... You know, you know when your kids start growing up and they start going to other people's places and they find out that your way of doing things is not the only way? <laughs> Has anyone experienced that? It's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing. And, and uh, you kind of have this, well, this is, how, this is, you know, everybody keeps their house a certain way, certain levels of tidiness, have certain routines, and, and then they start going to their friends' houses and they go, oh, they do it really differently. You know, I had... In, I think in a, a similar revelation when I was at Bible school where we did a week of really trying to understand the Father's heart. And we were a fairly close-knit group by this stage, and so we are pretty open about it. And it was, it was really telling for me that a whole group of leaders that we were doing Bible school with um, had such a different upbringing and understanding of God and his heart towards them because of the experiences in their life. And what, what it showed is that what happens is that we get our identity from a whole lot of things. Our experience is one. Our family is a big one. Um, and our parents, we obviously look up to because of so much references to the, the Father heart of God, the um, God being our Father, it can be very natural to 
perceive the Father through the lens of what we see of our own fathers. And sometimes that can skew what he's really like because we might think that God is just that little bit critical or a little bit um, distant or a little bit judgmental or a little bit um, unstable or changing their minds or maybe just absent or maybe passed away and that God won't always be with me. Maybe just human because they are. And so we get a filter in which we can sometimes have the wrong perception of God, our Father. But our Father's heart towards us is more like, you know when you've had kids and you just don't think you could love anything more than that little bundle? <laughs> Remember that? If those of you who haven't had kids, it's the best thing, it's the thing that gets you through all the dirty nappies and the sleepless nights and the driving around at night and it's that it's that thing that you just you didn't even expect that you could your heart could be so overwhelmed towards somebody but that's the father's heart towards us as my mother-in-law is really good at putting stuff on uh, facebook when she sees a missing persons report from the police every time she'll put it on and you know how easy it is to just sort of flick past that you go oh yeah there's another one someone's missing and we do. But just imagine if it's your child, how you then feel. You would stop on that page. You're the emotion of having them listening and what you do. And, and that's the way God feels about each and every one of us. He, he wants to affirm us. He wants everybody to know that they are loved and that he's proud of them as a father would to a child. And some of us have probably never heard those words. Some of us have probably heard them, but it's been a long time. Sometimes, it's, um, sometimes they've been said, but we don't necessarily receive them, uh, how they were said. Now, I've got a story for you, because we are going to talk about the Bible. I would like to tell, talk to you about the story of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Now, most of you will know it, so... Just in case you don't, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis. Jesus was taken into the wilderness, and he was there for 40 days, and he didn't eat, so he was really, really hungry. At that point, the devil came and tempted him, and he gave him uh, three temptations that were recorded. One was, um, if you're the son of man, command the stones to turn into bread. And Jesus replied, it's written, uh, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So it didn't work. So the next one... Jesus um, is there. The devil says, takes, actually takes him up into Jerusalem to the high point of the city and says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself off of this uh, holy temple and because uh, it's written that the angels will, he will command the angels to care for you, to lift them up in your hand and you won't strike your foot on the rock. And Jesus said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then Satan, not to be defeated, takes Jesus to a big hill, to a mountain, and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and boasts or claims that he has the authority and ownership to give to Jesus if he'd like him. All you have to do is bow down to me and worship me. And Jesus replies with another scripture. It is written, uh, um, serve, worship the Lord your God only and serve him only. So I don't know how you uh, interpret that story, um, but the way I've interpreted, which I think is a fairly normal interpretation, is that the way to deal with temptations and overcoming sins is to really know your scriptures, to have the right scripture at the right time, to, to combat the thing that um, is coming against you at the time that you're trying to overcome, that you're trying to get victory in. If you can get the right scripture, um, that'll give you strength, and it will. But I want to put this to you. There's a whole lot more going on in this story than just that than just knowing the scriptures are you interested in finding out yeah. all right i want to tell you but before i do i actually have to take you back one story i have to tell you what happened immediately before jesus went out into the into the uh the wilderness now what happened was that 
Jesus came to John the Baptist who was baptizing people and got baptized. And something very, very significant happened at that time. Now, um, I spend a lot of time in my own head and um, I wonder about things. I, I wonder what's the force that keeps protons and neutrons together in the atom. And the other day on Mother's Day, how did all those pop-up stalls occur to sell flowers on Mother's Day? I mean, and even florists sell them on the side of the road now. But they could just open. But they, okay. And I've got a few ideas, but no real concrete answers on that one. But, you know, I wonder. I wonder, Jesus and John the Baptist, they were relatives, right? They, they knew each other. How much time did they spend to with each other growing up? Just, you know, it, the Bible says that Elizabeth, the, the mother of John, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were relatives. And so they would have spent a fair bit of time together. Did they sort of play? And did they, as they're growing up, did they start to wonder if they were different? We do know that Jesus, when he was 12, was um, at the feast. And there was, like I say, eight feasts during the year. So at least those times, probably John and Jesus got together if they didn't sort of play every day. I don't know. I just wonder. But he was at the feast in Jerusalem and the rest of the family went home. They're looking, where's Jesus? And he's not there. They go back and they find him in the temple in his father's house. He was really comfortable knowing that God was his father. So there's that. I don't, know. I don't know how open you guys are in your family to talk about sex or what Mary and Joseph were like, but can you imagine that question? <laughs> Dad, how are babies made? Oh, awkward. Also complicated <laughs> in this situation. Do we tell him? Like Mary and Joseph looking at each other over the, t over the table. Oh, uh, you can tell him. <laughs> tell him. I don't, did they know? Did they start to? There's a bit of an inkling when, when John um, was baptizing and Jesus came to him that um, maybe they, they knew that there was something special about them because John was baptizing and he said to Jesus, I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, just to fulfill righteousness now, let it be like this at the moment. And the significance that John was baptizing people, the John, John the disciple wrote this in his, his gospel about quoting John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, John did know Jesus, but he didn't perhaps know who the Messiah was. Absolutely for sure. But when Jesus was baptized, it was revealed. Because what happened was that when Jesus was baptized, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he, went, he came up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And then what happened next is really, really important. There was a voice from heaven... And it said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the significance of this is that Jesus got that word of affirmation, that absolute knowing that he was God's son. And then he was taken by the Holy Spirit out into the desert to be tempted. At that point, he hadn't performed any miracles and he hadn't started his ministry. Have you heard the word of God over your life that he loves you and that he's proud of you? And do you know it? absolutely know it in here because that's the thing that made the difference for Jesus these temptations turn out to be what he believed I've only found two things two, two places in scripture or two things that the Bible tells us to work really hard at he tells us to work hard at entering our rest and it tells us to work hard at believing there's something in in really making sure that we believe 
that sets us really firmly. If you, can you grab your right hand? Grab your right hand and uh, put it on your, over your heart. This is over your, this is your anatomical heart. <laughs> you may feel it beating. But you may, our hearts sort of represent the real us when we talk about it, the heart of a person, what, what we really are. And just think for a moment, um, if you were to describe you to somebody, what would you say? How would you describe yourself? And then, then just to be even more honest, how, would you, how do you describe yourself to yourself? Just think for a moment. And above and beyond that, what we need to know is what God says about us. Because that's where the, the security and the, the foundation and the surety and the confidence comes from. Yeah. A confidence that's not an arrogance, but a confidence in knowing that we are the children of God and that he loves us so much. So back to my story, temptation. If you consider this, this had to be Satan's big shot at derailing God's whole plan for mankind, plan of salvation. He had an opportunity here to really take Jesus out. So just think about this. The temptations, these things that he's come out with Jesus, got to be his absolute best shot, right? Best thing he can come up with. I will quickly, I just want to read through the story, just so that we know we're on the same page. That Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. What is really going on here? Forty days and forty nights not eating, you'd be really hungry, right? Really hungry. I've managed to fast for three days and I can... Oh. The roast lamb that I had at the end of that, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, he'd be starving. Oh, flashbacks. Um, you just imagine, so imagine this scene, and, and, and Satan's saying to him, if you just, just turn those stones into bread, and, and you won't be hungry anymore. And Jesus could have done it. Why didn't he do it? Like, why, why not? I mean, yes, he would have been... Maybe even thinking, well, if I do that, I won't be hungry now, but that's not going to sustain me. And in fact, in fact, the way he replied, it was written, uh, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that word is the, the rima word, which is the alive and living word, that continual word, that word that I just heard from God today, this week, not something that happened 20 or 30 years ago. So maybe there's that. But what about this? If Jesus had have performed that miracle then, and he must have been really, really tempted, must have really wanted to, for it to be a temptation, it would have proven his identity. He would no longer have to just go, you know what, I believe I'm the son of God because I heard my father's voice. I've just proven that it's true. 
How does that parallel with our lives? How often have we heard and we know and we come to church and we know that God is our Father and that we are His children, but we seek proof? I just want, it'd just be so nice if God could just do this for me and prove rather than me work hard to believe and have that confidence and security against whatever circumstance I'm facing that I'm his child. The next one gets even weirder because let's think about this for a moment. Jesus is up on the top of the temple in Jerusalem and Satan says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Why is that even a temptation? Why would Jesus want to do that? That would not tempt me at all. I don't, seriously, I, I thought about this when I was preparing it, and there, I thought there's actually a couple of guys in this church that I do think would, that would be a temptation. One's on a trip in the Philippines, and the other one had a birthday recently. And so, some of you know, they're crazy guys. They go, yeah, this is great. But I wouldn't want to jump off, the, off a cliff. So what's going on here? You know, Satan is questioning Jesus' identity. He's going, you know, here's, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to prove that you are the Son of God. Not to just have to believe the Father's word, but to actually prove it. Not only that, but, and, and Jesus must have been really tempted. He must have thought, if I was to do that and actually have all the angels come and lift me up, that's, that's going to set me up pretty nicely for not having to just believe, but to be able to do what I want and not really have any consequences. Because God will take care of me, fix it up. If, even if I mess up, make stupid decisions, make unwise choices, you have to fix me up. How does that parallel with our lives? It's a question about our identity. And then the last one, so again, big shot. This is, this is Satan's opportunity to try and tempt Jesus to derail him. He takes him up to a mountain and says, looks over all the kingdoms of the world and says, I'll give you all of this. Now let's think about it. Jesus must have really desired that. Now if he didn't, it wasn't a temptation. So there must have been something that in his natural form, he would have thought, I would, that's what I want. I don't know about you, I wouldn't. I, I'm like, I'm a bit OCD and I have enough trouble just keeping my garden how I like it, little spot. And as far as the responsibility of rolling, ruling the world, no thank you. But Jesus, this was a temptation. What was he tempting him with? Well, the scriptures say that the world was created through him and by him. And that it's held together by him. So Jesus was already there. He already owns it. It wasn't Satan's to give. It said, the scriptures say that the, the government will be upon the shoulders of the Messiah, of Emmanuel, of Jesus. So if he knew who he was, that he really was the Son of God... He could stand firm against this temptation, that it didn't become a temptation. It wasn't, he, he could rise above it. And, and that's really what I want us to understand, is that overcoming temptation is so much about us having absolute surety and security in knowing that God is our Father, that he loves us and that he's proud of us. Because... When we have that, we actually walk almost above the temptation because things happen. And we, the things that we might have previously been tempted with are just not who we are. You know, I, I, I was trying to think of examples, and this, I don't know if this is a good example because it might take this the wrong way, but I, I don't really, I don't swear. And the people at work, sometimes they laugh at me, go, oh, we've never heard you swear. Okay, but I don't, I'm not tempted to because it's just not who I am. So it's actually not an issue. But, you know, if we walk around going, we don't feel insecure because that's not who we are anymore. We don't sabotage relationships because 
It's not who we are. We don't gossip because it's just not who we are. We're not tempted to pull other people down because that's not who we are. It's all those things that we tend to that we can be tempted to go to. We take away the power of them because we're just not who we are. I want to finish with this picture. The young royals. I'm not a I'm not a like a huge monarchist or a royal family fan, I don't think. But I do totally respect these guys. These young this generation of, of royals, I think have had just an inc- have just done an incredible job of negotiating a time such a difficult time to be in the royal family, to grow up in the age of technology with social media being um, just scrutinising every single thing that they do or say or wear. Um, and yet they've done it with a real sense of dignity and they've done it with a respect for tradition, um, but they've forged their own way where they've worked against racism and they've, um, and they've championed the, the underdogs. And so I just think huge, huge respect for them. Think for a moment, if you will, about how they must think compared to how we think. Because, I mean, that's a very unique situation, isn't it? To be born into such privilege and yet responsibility. And how, how they think would affect so much on how they behave. And I know there was blips along the way where it was obvious that they weren't real secure in their identity and <laughs> played up and like, and you know, I think we can probably relate to that and do the same. But as they've matured and become more secure in who they are, you know, they turn up to, a, to an event and they behave a certain way. You know, they're polite, respectful, because they represent the Windsor family. And it's an automatic thing. Um, if they, you know, we, we might get to personalize it, I guess. If God might call us to do something and you know, go, I want you to be involved in this ministry or go somewhere or do this. Do we really confidently and straight away go, yep, yep, I could do that? I'd go to New Guinea, for example. <laughs> Plug. Or, or go, oh no, I've got this excuse or I can't do that or I wouldn't be able to or. That we, we naturally think of these other with things we can't. But if somebody says to Prince Harry, for example, uh, do you reckon you could go across the other side of the world to open the Invictus Games? Where does his brain go? Oh, I don't know if I'll be able to do that. I don't know if I can organise that. I don't know if I could. I don't know. Or, goes, or absolute confidence that if I say yes to that and I want to, it'll happen. How's it has a difference thing? And and so the comparison is we've been adopted into a family that has given us both great privilege and responsibility. But it's about us knowing that God has spoken those words over us, that He loves us, and that He's proud of us. That He loves you and He's proud of you. And that you can walk through life with such a confidence and faith knowing that I think I might get you to stand again if that's alright we're going to spend a moment in prayer and it's like we did if you want to, if you want to open your arms by all means do but I want this to be between you and God and hearing from him The scriptures say, even as the musos come, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Lord, as we stand here before you now, we just let that cry of Abba Father come from our spirit. Lord, we ask for a, a word from you, a word to affirm 
that we really are who you say we are. Help us, Lord, to really believe, to have a confidence in you, not an arrogance, but a confidence that comes from knowing who we really are. Help us as we go forward, carrying that, that knowledge of sonship or daughtership in our hearts. Let it permeate us right into our hearts that we would really know, that we would really know that you are our Father. Perhaps in a new way, perhaps in a refreshed way. I oh, pray. In Jesus' name, as we stand here, and if we stand in his presence, I'm going to ask you, if, if you haven't got that, that fresh word of God you know, sitting in your heart and standing and, and sitting over your life, you just need to hear from God. We're going to open up this time to pray, to pray with you. And I, sh I really believe that there's a lot of people, and this is not, it's not like a big deal, and not to make it weird, but the prayer team are coming down, and the mature Christians who are just going to stand with you and pray with you, if you need to hear the voice of God, yeah. just to hear Him say over you, You are my son, you are my daughter, I love you. And I'm proud of you. Because it absolutely changed the course of history with what happened with Jesus. And it can change the course of your history. It can be really significant. Sometimes we don't even know what we're missing. If you come, come forward and just say, you know, these guys are going to pray. We'll pray with you. We're simply just going to stay over you. The Father says, by the Holy Spirit, that he loves you, that he's proud of you. And then they, they may get a word. They may see a picture. They may say something like, I believe the, the Spirit's telling me that there's um, this. He'd like to encourage you in this way or another. And, and if... If that happens, that's awesome. It's encouraging and you don't need to do anything with that. You just take it as an encouragement. You just put it on the shelf and remember it. But I really believe that, that, there's, that so many of us need to just hear afresh from God that affirmation. And the Holy Spirit's telling me there's lots of people here that need to. There's, um, I'm going to... As I was praying, I just want to say a couple of things that specifically that I believe Holy Spirit said. Um, there's a, a few people here that when we when I said put your hand on your heart and just think about who you are, the first things you thought of were negative. There's negative things about yourself. And the Holy Spirit wants to say, just come down and have someone pray for you because he wants to heal you of that. You don't want to continue doing that. And then there's a couple more people who have been thinking about this and go, you know what, I realize insecurity actually sabotage the past relationships, things at work and friendships and family. And the Holy Spirit would say to you, that does not have to continue to be your story. He's saying, come down and receive prayer. So 